Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you are well. If you're new here, hello, my name is Anna and today I'm going to be talking about the 20 books that I read in 2020. So I've spent the last couple of days going back through all the texts that I've read and making notes from them, kind of mulling over my thoughts and giving them a ranking. So we are ranking these from the best to the worst reads, or rather we're gonna start with the worst and go to the best. This was a goal that I set for myself in January last year because I've always enjoyed reading, but I just never found myself prioritizing it. I think this had a lot to do with it. The old phone, very big distraction. But I'll say that the only reason I made that goal is because I did two very specific things. One of them was I set a sort of smart goal, you could say, like a very trackable, tangible kind of habit that I had to do every day. And that was to read for five minutes. That was my goal, to read for five minutes every day of the year. And I will say that I did not do that. There were some days in the year that I didn't read. However, there were also lots of days where I read way more than five minutes, obviously, to get through 20 books. But the idea of the five minute rule is that it's a small enough time that for the most part, you're never going to be like, Oh, I can't fit that in, you know? But I did keep it up solidly for like the first few months of the year really well, and I feel like that helped to really solidify the habit of daily reading for me. So if you're someone that struggles to find the motivation to pick up your book and actually spend some time reading, set a really achievable goal. It could be five minutes of reading every day. It could be, I have to read at least a page. <laughs> Something so small and achievable that you'll actually do it and stick with it. So that was like my first thing that I think really helped me to reach my goal. The second thing was that I've started charging my phone in another room. I don't have this next to my bed at night. I have my charger in here in the office. And so that means at a certain time I plug it in to charge overnight and I set my alarm and then it gives me about an hour or so to wind down for bed without the screen, which is good for my sleep as well. But it also means that I have no distractions when I get into bed so that I can just sit down and do my reading and fall asleep. So these habits work so well that I'm already halfway through my second book of the year for 2021. I am doing 21 books in 2021. I know it's only like a small step up, but I just want it to be a really gradual increase in my reading each year. I don't wanna make a huge jump that I possibly won't be able to achieve or I'll find it a bit much pressure. There's also a few books that I read this year that I'd like to reread and I sort of feel like I might try and do like 21 new books this year and so I might have a few extras that I'll fit in um, that are rereads. So before we jump into the best and worst of the books that I read this year, uh, I'll quickly give you a rundown on I guess of what my sort of reading style is and what genres I love. For me the books that I gravitate towards the most are either like inspiring biographies mind blowers which is a term that i use kind of for like really deep reads or like philosophical kind of reads ones that really make you like hmm think about life <laughs> and also learning about wisdom from like other cultures and ways of life so that's they're the kind of books that i find really interesting i'm sad to say that i only read one novel this year and that's much to my husband's dismay however this year i do want to read at least five novels in the year so i'm going to try and up my novel reading because there are some amazing novels out there and i do feel like it's a a genre of books that i just haven't really touched into. And saying that, most avid readers that I know are into novels and that's pretty much what they only read. So if you're coming to this video expecting to see a massive list of like great novels, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. This is just a list of 20 books that I read that I really gravitated towards based on recommendations from people or just even Googling. Because there are 20 books to talk about, they will be very, very brief summaries. So just be aware, like I'm gonna try and not spoil books and just give very quick little summaries and kind of overall thoughts. Um, but we're going to start with the worst book that I read this year. Oh, one other thing. I read most of my books on my Kindle. I do have a few hard covers for books that I just really like love the cover of. They're almost like decor in my home as well. Or ones that I got given as a gift. Or maybe they're like ones you can't buy on Kindle. But most books I read, I get on my Kindle. Okay, so the book that I ranked the lowest out of the 20 that I read this year is Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. I gave this a four out of 10. This book wasn't um, horrible, but it just so was not really my cup of tea. Just lots of things in it that I just was like, Ooh, just didn't sit with me as a human. You might know Elizabeth Gilbert a bit better from her personal memoir, Eat, Pray, Love. I haven't actually read the book, but I have seen the movie. It was okay. This book was actually recommended to me by a friend and I like picked it up and started reading it before I knew that it was the author of Eat, Pray, Love. I might not have 
had I known that information. But the friend that recommended it to me is a very dear friend of mine and I can see why this sort of book appeals to her but upon reading it I just didn't get as probably as much out of it as maybe she'd hoped I would. Basically the book is kind of a self-reflection on the author's creative process and so I guess it's meant to be kind of like self-help like you can get inspiration from it and maybe apply those techniques and ways of thinking to your own creative processes but I personally found it to be a little too woo for my liking she gets really like quite sort of spiritual in the way she talks in terms of like just the way that ideas work and creativity flows and it was a wee bit too wooey is the best way to put it I believe that creativity is a force of enchantment, not entirely human in its origins. Ideas are a disembodied energetic life form. They are completely separate from us, but capable of interacting with us. Ideas have no material body, but they do have consciousness and they most certainly have will. Ideas are driven by a single impulse to be made manifest. And the only way an idea can be made manifest in our world is through collaboration with a human partner. It is only through a human's efforts that an idea can be escorted out of the ether and into the realm of the actual. Beautiful sentiment. Love that that's her way of like thinking of her creativity and ideas and I'm not knocking that but for me it just didn't gel. I just was like mm, I don't really buy that. Like that's not how I like to think of ideas creativity but if that sounds like the sort of thing you would love and would find really inspiring then you might really like it but for me that made this book sit at number 20. Number 19 on the list Dare to Lead by Brené Brown. Now Brené Brown is a very very big name in the sort of self-help genre and I've had a lot of people recommending her as an author for me because I do quite like you know self-help books there's quite a few on this list um, but this one I just was like yeah it's pretty good. I just didn't feel like I got a lot extra from it than what like things I've already read. And I guess because of Brene's been so like so hyped to me from others, I just was left feeling a little bit like it was okay. <laughs> I gave this one a six out of ten. But basically, this particular book is all about personal leadership and developing like personal courage. I think perhaps if I'd read this text like five years ago, I probably would have got so much more out of it. I just think that where I've developed as a human, I now sort of didn't really get a lot out of it. But I think if you're a lot younger, I think if you're in your like your early 20s and you're sort of developing into a new, you know, your career and adulthood, I think it's a really good book. Would not write off her as an author or anything. And this book, I certainly don't write off. It's just that for me, it wasn't the most inspiring or mind blowing or anything sort of book that I read this year. The next book is probably the shortest book I read. <laughs> it was so short, so much shorter than I expected it to be. Um, and that's kind of why I gave it like such a low grade, even though it was a really useful resource for me. It's called The Dip by Seth Godin. And this is a book that you could say in a long essay on figuring out in your life and your career and your relationships, you know, like when is the time to quit? And when is the time to push through? We can start out projects or sort of new areas of our life feeling really great. It's always you get that sort of like beginner's high. And then, you know, as you're like partway into something, the slog comes. Very much feel that in my PhD. <laughs> Sometimes in those moments when you're at the lowest of lows in a project or a big endeavor, that's when you kind of feel like this isn't working, it's too hard, I should quit. And there are signs sometimes that you should quit. It's about knowing when to quit, when it's strategically good to quit, or when you should just push through the dip and things will come out the other side even stronger. It helped me with a particular kind of situation that I was dealing with, so I did find it a really good resource. Even though it is super short, there is no fluff, so it is, I mean, that's why it's short. Um, I would have loved some more like sort of personal anecdotes and things in it. I think it could have been fleshed out a bit more, but if you if that sounds like something that would help you with you know a situation in your life right now to help you with a particular decision knowing when to like sort of quit or cut things off or push through and persevere um, it was very useful number 17 is by an author that i read like three books of this year and i read another one of hers in 2019 as well it's called we are in this together by beth kempton now beth kempton is a self-help writer from the uk and she is by far my favorite self-help writer because she writes in a very 
warming, nurturing, caring kind of tone that's slightly poetic as well. So it's actually a really beautiful read. Sort of feels a little bit like a motherly figure. I mean, she is a mum, so she just writes in that way that is very like nurturing and like she's holding your hand through the process. And I gave this particular book, we are in this together, a seven out of 10. This was a book that she wrote in lockdown. So right at the start of the year in like March, April. It's a very comforting read. It helps you to feel a lot less alone in the whole situation, kind of gives you some perspective of like, you know, others are going through the toughness of this as well. And I think it had some really useful strategies for coping with lockdown life and coping with 2020, particularly in the way of like grief strategies. It's not often talked about that like, we pretty much all grieved all last year and we all grieve in different ways and you know some of us might not have recognized that we were grieving I guess the loss of the life that we thought we'd have last year so this book is beautiful in that it does kind of help you to process some of that. I don't think it's quite as well crafted and written as some of her other books it's why it's like a little bit lower on the list but it is very beautiful comforting read basically. I read that in a time when I was just like ugh, having a real like mere, I think it was kind of like July, like middle of the year when I was just going through a really tough time with the whole Melbourne second lockdown and things. So if you are in another lockdown, if you're in the UK, the US or wherever there are like still a lot and lot of restrictions in the world, then I definitely recommend that one. Some books I've like pulled quotes from and others I didn't, but this one I did. I thought it was quite nice just to give you like a flavor of what the book's about. Expectation is based on a set of assumptions about the future, which we can never know for sure. We can project and guess and hope and even enjoy the pleasure of anticipation but expectation is a false friend. Stability can make us feel safe, but it is a precarious stability that is built on the misguided assumption that things won't change because everything does. She's just very talented at packaging up like quite hard to hear sort of advice into, you know, very accessible and able to be absorbed way. That was really bad England. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like she just makes that kind of like, advice just easily absorbable and I really do feel like this book can help you to accept what you can't control which will ultimately make you a lot happier at just accepting the situation as it is right now and learning to cope through this hard time. Yeah I wrote the only reason it's a 7 out of 10 is because I felt it was a little short. I craved more and a deeper exploration of the ideas presented which in her book Wabi Sabi, which is what I read in 2019, I felt like she really did that. She just really deep dove into that. So I just wanted a little more fleshed out. So book number 16 was probably my most difficult read of the year, but it was probably one of the most important as well. So it is Black Politics by Sarah Madison. I gave this a 7 out of 10 as well. And this book covers the treatment and mismanagement really of Aboriginal Australians in white Australia. Particularly looking at the failed racist policies that have led Aboriginal Australians to be in the situation they are today. I did find it very powerful. It was very draining read though because obviously it's like kind of written in a little bit more of a drier academic style so, so I do feel like it's an important one to do like chapter by chapter. I took about six months to read it. I am a chronic multi-book reader, like I'll have like five books on the go at once, or maybe that's an exaggeration, maybe like three books on the go. But particularly if I'm reading something heavy like this, I'll usually have something a little lighter on the side. It's confronting, and even though I'm not Australian, I'm still a white key, which is pretty close, and our treatment of Māori and Pacific Islander here in New Zealand is on a similar page. So I definitely think it's an important book. The reason I didn't give it like a higher score though was was the way it was written. I feel like its message could be portrayed better. Uh, it could be more easily absorbed by people if it was just written a bit more stylistically. Uh, it does read very dry and academically. The book though that I did actually originally get to kind of balance this one, which ended up being another very draining kind of like tough to absorb book that I had to really take my time with so it wasn't the best choice. Um, also took quite a few months to read this one. It is Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells and this I gave a 7.5 out of 10. I enjoyed this a little bit more like it flowed a little bit more particularly from sort of the sort of second half of the book. It really I found it quite captivating like I wanted to keep reading whereas the first bit I was like I know I should read this this is very important but it maybe wasn't as the most like, oh, you know, I want to get into bed and read my book. And that is because it again is very confronting. It is a book about climate change and it really just lays it all out, the kind of disaster we're in for if we continue on the current path. And it really was a very, very fleshed out 
um, study of it, which I think is wonderful. I think it's going to make a fantastic resource for, you know, papers to draw on and things like that. It doesn't read the most beautifully, but it is important. The first half in particular kind of reads a bit like a literature review and they're just sort of throwing information at you and it's quite overwhelming. I do feel like if you want to watch something on climate change that has to be honest just as much impact in a much shorter time with the most important information i definitely watched david Attenborough's new documentary his witness statement as he calls it on netflix that was a brilliant like one hour doco that just had the most crucial kind of parts from this kind of book the most crucial science to hear i feel like this book had a lot of stuff that maybe isn't so relevant for people to read but it's more so important for like politicians to read let's just say that that's probably the best way to put it Number 14 on the list is a biography about Jacinda Ardern, it's literally called Jacinda Ardern, by Michelle Duff. I gave this one a 7.5 out of 10. I read this right way back at the start of 2020, um, I even included it in my January favourites. I did really enjoy it, I just think when I kind of went to do all my ranking, there were books that I read later in there that kind of I enjoyed it even more um, but I did really like it. Jacinda is a very inspiring figure whether you agree with her politics or not and obviously I do recognize that I probably do have some bias because I do like Jacinda as a person. I think her politics are very in line with mine or at least most of them are but I think like politics aside the book really does a great job at just acknowledging the impact she's had on politics um, as quite a what you'd call like new age female figure of politics. Her signature sort of style in politics is one of caring and warmth and empathy and that really resonated with people all around the world. Here's a little quote pulled from the book in reference to the March 15th attack in Christchurch. Ardern's was such a human response. It was warm. I've heard words like nurturing and maternal. It was not a strategy we're used to seeing from world leaders, the majority of whom are men. Sending thoughts and prayers have been written so often by those in power that they have become a euphemism for doing absolutely nothing. Even when a politician does attend the scene of a tragedy, it's usually to jet in, look sombre, shake a few hands and leave. The only thing I didn't maybe love about the book is I felt like the author herself maybe, maybe put a little bit too much of herself into it. I don't know if that's really a criticism, it's just like for my own personal preference. Um, there were sort of some parts I was like, is this relevant? But I guess, you know, each author is different, that's her style. Um, I did really enjoy the writing, but yeah, there were just at times I was like, is this relevant? So that's the only reason I gave it a seven and a half out of 10 rather than a higher mark. Book number 13 on my list is another one by Beth Kempton. And this is one that I read pretty much directly after the we are in this together book because I just I needed more from Beth I needed her comforting soul <laughs> and her comforting writing in my life at that time so this one I felt was a better book I gave this an 8 out of 10 and this is a it's a self-help book that isn't too fluffy because it does contain very practical actionable tools that you can use to really like help you out of a rut in life so the idea behind this book, Freedom Seeker, is it's really to help, um, I guess particularly women, it is sort of targeted towards, although it could help anyone really, but particularly to help one get out of feeling kind of stuck and trapped in life. I think many of us sometimes sort of go along with life doing something and then sort of wake up a few years later and be like, ugh, I just feel a bit trapped, you know, like maybe trapped in obligation, trapped in a, a career, one might not love like there's lots of things that can make someone feel very trapped in life and so she gives you tools to kind of help break through the prison that you've like managed to get yourself into in life so i did really like it and i felt like it really just gave me like freedom in my mind particularly and i would read it again if i was ever feeling in that kind of stuck space i'd definitely go back to it do some of the exercises again i think it's a fantastic reference book because i feel like we all get those times in our life we feel a bit in a bit of a rut and a bit stuck uh, and we just kind of need to like break through so she's very good at helping kind of hold your hand through that process the next book could be quite controversial i feel like this video though to this point could have been quite controversial for some people because i do talk about politics but this next book in particular it's about religion mm, yep we're going there this book i borrowed from a friend who recommended it um and it's because i was going through a pretty sort of confusing time in my faith you could say so quick rundown i was raised christian in a christian family 
fairly conservative. I wouldn't say like ultra conservative, but you know, typical kind of go to church every week. But I've been like questioning things about Christianity and about my faith and that for many, many, many years. Honestly, even since I was a child, I just kind of felt very trapped by the whole thing and just not sure whether I can even like talk about it or whether I was allowed to question things if you know what I mean. Over the last like couple of years I've definitely like been doing even more deep thinking about it, reading a lot more into like other religions and just non-religions and you know just like life, the different options that one can live life um, and experience faith and spirituality and such. So my friend let me borrow this book, it's called Outgrowing God by Richard Dawkins. Now he is a very blunt kind of writer and I think he's quite aggressively atheist and I'm not sure if you are very much feeling solid in your faith I think you'll be very offended by this kind of writing I think if you are in a moment of questioning it could help you so I just wouldn't recommend this to anyone honestly if you are like feeling super yeah this is what I believe this is my life like I just think it's not going to be right for you I think if though you're in a stage of like questioning things in your faith, in your religion, in any, I'd say any monotheistic religion, so Judaism, Christianity, um, Islam, which are the sort of three big monotheistic religions, I think if you're kind of questioning things on that, then I think it is a good, good thing to read just to help add another perspective, because a lot of the time when we have questions about our faith, a lot of the books are then written from leaders in those faiths to try and kind of convert you back to the faith. So it's kind of like, I think it's important to read a range of things and just to go on that personal journey within yourself to find what works for you. So it is a blunt, challenging, thought-provoking read. I gave it though an eight out of 10 because I really do think it helped me on my own sort of personal journey. And I don't know if I feel comfortable at this stage to sort of talk about where I've like landed it's just such a personal thing and I'm just still processing stuff. I would say that if you feel like it might be a little bit much, I am going to recommend a book later on that I think is a better starting point uh, to this book. So I will, I'll mention that when we get there. But just because I say this book is quite, quite confronting. Before we move on though, I will just say I hold nothing against anyone for holding any different type of faith. Like faith, religion, all of that is very personal. I don't discriminate against anyone for believing in XYZ. So don't feel like if I'm in this weird kind of questioning phase that I think differently of those that are feeling really firm because it's like everyone's in a different space. Um, it means that different things to different people and I love everyone equally. So no judgment from me in regard to like religion. I hope that we can keep that sort of sense of just like respecting everyone's beliefs because this is a very accepting space here. Book number 11 is another kind of self-help sort of productivity almost leaning kind of book that I found super useful this year. Um, I watched a couple of videos from different YouTubers in that kind of sphere that make that sort of content and they were sort of referencing quotes from it and I was like oh I need to read that book. It is called Essentialism by Greg McCowan. McCowan? Didn't look up how to pronounce that. And I gave this book an 8 out of 10 as well. This book is all about helping you to discover what is like your most essential pursuit in life. And it particularly helped me being someone that's very multifaceted and I do a lot of, I have a very sort of portfolio career, you know, I'm a classical violinist and I'm also a teacher in that regard and but I also make YouTube videos and content online and like my career is very spread. And reading this made me very, like it really challenged me to just essentialize things a little bit more. I will say that for a long time, I'd been feeling very torn between my kind of two identities of like Anna Morton, the violinist, and Anna Elaine, the beauty guru. And I just felt so torn for so long between them. And I knew there was a point where I was like gonna have to merge things. And I felt like over 2020, I really came to a good place where Yes, I can create videos online, like just because I'm not necessarily performing 24-7 doesn't mean that I'm not pursuing a single goal. Um, it's just that I identify as Anna Elaine Morton, violinist, who shares her life online and the different things that inspire my music and inspire me as a person in my career. So I feel like we've come to a good place where I have a very clear vision of who I am and what I bring to the world and it's helped me to kind of 
get rid of the tasks and the things in my work and the things in my day that I kind of was doing because I felt like I should be doing and just help me to craft a more defined career for myself that fitted my needs and where I saw myself going, if that makes sense. One of my other favorite takeaways from the book was this concept of protecting the asset, which was a really useful tool for me to, again, like learn how to say no to certain things that were gonna be draining or that didn't really serve me. And yeah, just protecting me as a person, making sure I get enough sleep, eating well, like realizing that those self-care, those actual self-care habits are so essential for me doing my best work. So instead of working harder, essentially learning how to work smarter. Oh, and another thing I loved about it, she kind of is very anti-multitasking, uh, which really hit like me here. Like I was like, oh yes, sometimes I do multitask uh, and to my detriment. I don't think there's any harm doing like multitasking in the sense of like listening to a podcast while you're like vacuuming or, you know, like multitasking with mundane chores or things like that. But if I'm like trying to edit, having my phone up so I could see notifications for things would cause me to kind of, you know, jump between the tasks all the time and that actually isn't as productive as just solidly sitting there and working on something. I was very good at protecting my space and music practice in that, like I have good practice hygiene in that way, but I wasn't really translating that to other areas of my life. So this book really helped me to become very anti-multitasking and be a bit more mindful in my work and in the way I live. This next one was super, super helpful again. It's called Self-Compassion by Dr. Kristen Neff. Again, I gave this an eight out of 10. This is a book I read near to the start of the year and I think it is a really important read for everyone. I think we all can learn to be a bit more self-compassionate, which ultimately makes one become more compassionate to others. We've all kind of heard that saying that like the bullies and the kind of mean people in the world, it's sort of more of a reflection on how they view themselves than actually, you know, you the one being hurt. So that's kind of stems from if one can learn to be self-compassionate to themselves, then they're probably gonna be more compassionate and loving towards others. It helped me to deal with a lot of like past shames and traumas and just helped me to cope better, I think through the pandemic as well, because I read this pre-pandemic, I was kind of already prepared with, you know, going into the pandemic feeling really like scattered and anxious and also like some days just having absolutely no will to do anything. I think past me would have berated myself for it, but like, new 2020 me having read this book kind of was like it's okay you know life happens and I could self-soothe myself out of those sort of situations. I really do believe that like reading this book will make you a better person not just like a kinder person to yourself but to others so definitely one I've raved about before I remember talking about it in a favorites video because I really enjoyed it. Number nine on the list was a book that I got sent from a subscriber which was so lovely and it's a very inspiring biography about Nancy Wake so this was written by Russell Braddon. I gave this an eight and a half out of ten. I really, really enjoyed it. This is one of those books that I feel like it's a biography, but it's kind of written in the style of a novel. This book follows the story of the Kiwi-born woman, Nancy Wake, through her life during the Second World War, like just before the lead up to the Second World War and through the Second World War, living in France. She was married to a Frenchman. She became very sort of French herself. But during the war, she became a spy for England as part of their special operations executive, which if you don't know, the SOE waged like a secret war against the Germans with a lot of undercover sabotage and subversion in occupied France. So Nancy was one of their agents and she was so good at her job that she became one of their Gestapo's most wanted. Reading about the kind of things she had to do and the situation she was put in, I personally found very like, it sort of put things in perspective for me with 2020. Like it's very easy to sit there and be like, this is the hardest thing ever. And look, 2020 was hard and, and it's still hard. 2021 is still hard for many of you overseas that are still like in lockdowns. But then you sort of like read books like this and sort of see what they had to go through in the war. And it does actually, I personally find it brings me a lot of comfort to read those kind of things. For others it might not, it could be quite traumatic, but I personally got a lot of comfort reading it. I was very inspired. It gave me a lot of like, zest to kind of you know power on through with things and yeah i found it a really inspiring biography about a fantastic woman so highly recommend that one number eight on my list was one of the best selling books i think of 2020 like it was a very popular book i've had i've heard heaps of people referencing it and have loved it this um, last year as well and it is atomic habits by james clare i gave this one an eight out of eight and a half Sorry, eight and a half out of 10. I do think it's a bestseller for a reason. It was incredibly 
inspiring but also so practical and that's what I think I loved about it. It gave you very actionable steps and processes to try to establish very effective habits. I have implemented lots of the tools that he suggests and have found them to be very very helpful. A lot of things I already kind of was doing like in regards to sort of like making habits as achievable as possible well, like I talked about with the reading goal of doing like a five minute like really small kind of mini habit having that sort of habit trigger of just like picking up the book and reading for five minutes um, that was obviously to help me establish a habit of reading every day and that's sort of something he talks about in the book as well as like habit stacking i heard jessica braun talking about habit stacking the other day so she must have read this book but that's when you take a habit that's already well established in your life say brushing your teeth and you stack another new habit onto it so it could be like jessica was talking about taking your vitamins or for me it'd be like remembering to take my contraceptive pill <laughs> it's honestly probably the best book on habits and that kind of productivity like learning to be better kind of human optimization kind of books that I've read in a long time so I really enjoyed it. Seventh on the list is the sequel to one of the other books I'm going to talk about later so that obviously this is my like least favorite out of the two by Yuval Noah Harari and it's called Homo Deus and this is the sequel book to Sapiens. Um, I gave this one an eight and a half out of ten. Yeah. Sapiens is basically the story of humankind to today and Homo Deus is the sequel that sort of looks at today and beyond. This is what I classify as one of those mind-blowing reads. This is very sort of deeply thought-provoking, philosophical, kind of like, whoa. It is quite intense, like the language he uses and so the way he writes can be quite like a lot, like you really have to be focused. You can't be multitasking at all with this kind of read. Um, it's a very deep read, but I loved it. I love that kind of thing. Extremely thought-provoking and interesting, I wrote and at times challenging. Looking at how humans and the world are going to interact with things like robots, um, artificial intelligence, the future of algorithms controlling the world. Kind of amazing, kind of scary, but I think just fascinating. Oh, and the world's future religion as well called data religion. It's just like bizarre. This is all probably stuff that will like happen probably once I'm gone, but you know, I still just find it really fascinating read. It also goes on to kind of further challenge our beliefs and views of the world, society. It also gives you a new kind of insight into understanding why and how you react to things, why you think certain things, the, the biological algorithm of emotions. And it just, for me, I personally enjoyed learning about how our bodies really biologically work in that way and how emotions and thoughts and this idea of like having free will but it's actually just this biological algorithm oh it's fascinating book number six on my list though is a novel this is the novel the one novel i read this year i didn't even buy it alex bought it for me for my birthday it is the handmaid's tale by margaret atwood so it's a very famous much loved novel i gave this one an eight and a half out of ten and now that i'm kind of looking at it i feel like maybe it should be a 9 out of 10. I don't know. It was very good. It's basically a dystopian story set in this sort of totalitarian state um, called Gilead in what was previously the United States or a part of the United States. And in this state, it's a very like patriarchal state. Women are a property of the state. Some women are like wives of the sort of men running things and other women, the, the few fertile women that are left because for some reason fertility is declining rapidly. There are a few fertile women left and they are made to be like sex slaves essentially, like um, handmaidens or sex servants. The idea is that they have the children of the rich couples. And so this story follows um, one of the handmaidens and her journey through all of this and it is written in a very beautiful unique style of writing. Uh, I found it to be very gripping, like I kept wanting to read it. Even a little bit thrilling at times as well. Book number five is another book from Beth Kempton. And I don't know, I feel like some of these ones in the top five, you're probably gonna be like rolling your eyes at because they are kind of feel good, like soul warming kind of little books. It's called Calm Christmas and a happy new year a little book a festive joy this one i gave an eight and a half out of ten as well this is a very cozy and comforting read but i also find it to be very practical so the book is basically designed to give you lots of practical exercises and journal sort of prompts to ensure that you have a very mindful and like stress-free festive season i don't feel like christmas has ever been a particularly stressful time of year for me but i know some people 
feel very stressed by it all and very overwhelmed and she just helps you to like question which elements of Christmas are things you should even really care about, which things are things you can totally let go. Having it be a much more peaceful and happy and joyous time and reflective time as well. So my suggestion is to start the book in like late October, early November, because there's kind of some like pre-work and then like through the festive season, you can read a few more chapters. And then there's a few chapters at the end, which you can save for those beautiful few days in between Christmas and New Year that she calls Twixmas. And those are the days where like time seems to kind of just halt and you know, it's a really great time to harness for like reflection and that's what we did. We actually took this book and our journals and went round to one of the bays in the Banks Peninsula and just like sat there and, you know, had a coffee at a cafe and just like did our little exercises and reflected on the year and tried to sort of make plans for the year ahead, even if plans are a bit hard to do for this year, but it was just a very comforting, cozy read around Christmas. It kind of gets you in the vibe and I found it very practical. So that's why I love it. I definitely will read it again. It's actually the second time I've read it. I read it first in 2019, uh, but I wanted to read it again. I didn't finish it all last year. So that's why I kind of wanted to read the whole thing. You can see there's a bunch of like dog ears still in there from where I'm like, oh, that's a good exercise. That's a good exercise. I find these kind of books very good kind of antidotes to those very heavy deep philosophical reads like I kind of like one or the other. <laughs> Book number four though is another biography and it is The Woman Who Cracked the Anxiety Code, The Extraordinary Life of Dr. Claire Weeks. And this was written by an Australian journalist called Judith Huare probably not pronounced that way, but um, I gave this book a nine out of 10. I loved this book. It was very good, very inspiring. It is the story about, as I say, Dr. Claire Weeks, who was an Australian doctor, twice doctor. She did a PhD and then an actual medical doctorate, but she specifically helped people to deal with their anxiety. She wrote many texts on the topic in the later part of her life, but the most famous one was Self Help for Your Nerves. I think it came out in the 60s. And this book is just a biography of who she was as a person and I just found it so inspiring. She is an amazing woman. For one, she really pushed to get the education she wanted to get in a very sort of male dominated um, genres. I think she was the first Australian woman to get a PhD in science in Australia back at the early 20th century. And then at one point she was interested in like pursuing music as a career. And then after suffering with anxiety herself, she realized she wanted to kind of go into that field and help others with things that worked for her. Um, and so she wrote a self-help book that was a much more accessible kind of treatment for people. Like they just go pick up the book, follow her instructions. And um, it really kind of shook up a lot of that kind of stale theories in the psychology world. And she was just a very inspiring woman that probably didn't get enough, typically in female's fashion, didn't get enough recognition for the work that she's done and the people that she's helped. So I was just like, woo, the whole time. Just like so inspiring. Also as someone that has suffered with anxiety myself, I guess I just resonated with it in that way a bit more too. So that's why I like gave it a nine out of 10. Just had to change the battery. That's how you know I have talked for too long in this video. Third place, I had to give it to this book that I read in December. And it's one that I picked up totally on a whim in like a gift shop. I saw it and was like, oh, I love the cover. And then I sort of read the blurb and I thought, yes, that sounds exactly like a similar kind of vibed book to Beth Campton's Wabi Sabi, which as I say, I read in 2019. And it is Ikigai, The Japanese Secret to a Long and Happy Life. As I said at the beginning of this video, like those kind of books discussing like philosophies and ways of life of different cultures and, you know, different areas of the world. They're some of my favorite reads. I love getting inspired by the way people live um, outside of my circle and upbringing. Ikigai is basically the concept of finding your like reason for getting out of bed in the morning. The thing that you bring to the world that you both love, that you're good at, that, um, brings you joy and kind of, as I say, gives you the will to live because ultimately that is what helps people to live a long and happy life. And it includes lots of quotes and such from their interviews with some of the Japanese super centenari centenarians, centenarians, <laughs> super centenarians, which are people that have lived like beyond 110. So these are like the really long livers of the world. In Okinawa, Japan, that's like a province of the world that has some of the longest living people in the world. And they sort of look at why these people live so long. Um, the number one trait between every single person that they interviewed is that they all kept a garden. <laughs> Plants make people live longer. But I think particularly the idea of like having a purpose, these, these people would jump out of bed in the morning, tend to their garden and then go about the rest of their day. And like they sort of 
had found their ikigai I guess. I loved the way it was written, I loved the kind of um, touches on some more like Eastern traditions that it infused into it and it builds a little bit as well on the idea of like resilience through hard times and they reference a book in it which is actually one that I've just started reading this month I'm sort of halfway through it it's called Anti-Fragile and that's like something they quote in this book so I like marked it and like got that book out and I am loving that book that's like a deep 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 dive on that sort of topic but it's a very accessible read as well so I feel like it's a really nice like like the way it's written is very accessible, it's not too academic. And I found myself thinking about elements from the book and lots of different things in life. That's how I know I've really absorbed the message. Number two of the books that I read this year is in the very similar vein to Ikigai. Um, and this is The Little Book of Hygge, which is the Danish way to live well. This is by Meek Viking. I presume that the W is pronounced like a V, but it's probably something it's probably pronounced completely differently if it's Danish and Mike is from the Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen because yes they have a whole research institution dedicated to happiness which I just love this again is a book that is very lightweight it's beautiful it's almost like a very fleshed out kind of coffee table book like you can open it up at any sort of page and just read a little section and just enjoy it for two minutes um, or you can sit there and read it like I did from front to back and just love it the whole way through. But I do recognize that it is a very light weight kind of read. But as I say, I also read some books that were really fat and full and deep and intense. So these kind of lighter weight books are very necessary in my reading program. But you also know if you've watched my channel a lot this year, I have an absolute like fascination with Danes and Danish people and the way that Danish people live their lives. And I'm just really drawn to it. So I loved learning a little bit more about Hygge and the concept of Hygge. As the book kind of explains, it is very hard to describe what Hygge is. It's kind of just a thing that Danish people feel and other cultures have similar kind of expressions. For me, it's kind of about mindful living like in a cozy way, like finding coziness in simple things and doing mindful daily tasks. At least that's kind of how I interpret it, but it is hard as a non-Danish person to kind of, you know, understand such a deep concept. A little bit in the way that I, as a non-Japanese, you know, maybe struggle to understand the concept of wabi-sabi, even though I've read a whole book on it and, and loved what I read about it and learned, but it's hard to describe, like, what is wabi-sabi? It's not just things wearing out and looking aged and that makes it wabi-sabi like it's it's so much deeper than that it's something that only really Japanese people will understand much in the way that hygge is something that really only Danish people understand deeply but I did love learning about it um, and again beautiful little book I actually picked this up in 2019 in Copenhagen although they sell it literally all over the world but that brings me to my favorite book of the year and since I sort of mentioned it earlier and said it'll be on the list a bit later it is Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. I gave this book a 10 out of 10. For me, it was the perfect book. It was meaty, it was a history book, it was a philosophical book, it was a deep thinking book, a mind blowing book, and I just can't recommend it enough. So this is the book that, when I was talking a bit before about that book, Outgrowing God, this is the book I'd read first, especially if you are a bit worried that the other one might be a little bit of a slap in the face. This book touches on elements of that in a very subtle way. It sort of examines, I guess, the development of humankind from the very beginning, from like early, you know, civilizations, agricultural revolution through the ages, and it looks at the development of religion in that as well. So for me, that was a really good starting place. It gave me such a deep understanding about humanity and the way that we've developed and about our, our relationship to the world itself as well and the planet and to animals. And it was just really good like there's a reason it is recommended a lot i know a lot of people talk about it it's one that i would read again i don't know if i'll read it again this year because it's quite a beefy read um and i do still have 21 books to read <laughs> but we'll see how we go that brings us to the end of this video i hope you guys enjoyed it i know it was a long one i really did try to do very small summaries but they still took up about eight pages of my notebook i also hope that it was a bit insightful into my mind and the things that I like to feed it. Don't forget to give this video a like on the way out and make sure you're subscribed as well so you don't miss any more of my content. And until my next video, I hope you guys have a wonderful couple of days and we'll talk soon. Bye.